and live again. Uh, anyway, just happened to be awake. So I said, oh, I'm awake. It's 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, now 5.20. Um, so, yeah, I'll do something with my awakeness. And physics came to mind, as it sometimes does. And so uh, I said, yeah, might as well open one of these rooms and do something productive, maybe. We'll see. Um, uh, just, uh, it's always stuff, you know, always. <laughs> yeah. It's always there. And, uh, you know, any one of these subjects, you could really take some time and work on them and um, say lots of things about the condition of uh, the knowledge base, let's call it, the presumption axiom base of physics, what they claim to be reality and how much of it has, um, you know, <clears throat> elements of whatever, God bothering almost, a religion of sorts, the dogmas that exist within this thing called science, and uh, is there any way to uh, do something about that? Some kind of practical manner. Um, yeah, which would be nice to be able to do something to fix it where it has, you know, these little bits that just are obviously there's something wrong with this diagram, I think. So there's two conservation issues. You know, uh, we talk a little bit about black holes in, in the context of lensing. And I think I'll try to do this screen share thing and play a video. We'll see how that works. I think you can do it. Yeah. Well, we'll try it. <laughs> yes, to see if the computer can handle it. Um, but all right, so there's two conservation issues with black holes. The first one is this idea that, you know, once you create this than space idea where you're not dealing with the real energy of the universe, something in the universe that's part of the universe we know, which obviously doesn't have too many infinite sources of anything. Everything has a finite, um, another finite amount of uh, ions in the atmosphere capable of, uh, you know, interacting with ultraviolet light and blocking it, the finite number of, you know, you just don't get away with this infinite thing. And they, you know, in their diagram of this gravity mechanism, they have somewhere, someone said, well, it's sort of an arbitrary thing, right? This this matter size density issue. We, we don't have to really obey the idea that matter um, comes in the form of atoms <laughs> and that atoms um, have a certain space requirement, and um, so we'll just pretend that rule doesn't exist as a conservation thing, that there's a finite smallness that you can compact mass into, and we'll pretend that mass is some sort of bend in space, that it's not something the, the matter has, it's, <laughs> you know, it's something in the space, and so we can just make up any kind of density kind of formula and say, let's make something that weighs as much as 10 million suns and we'll make it the size of a grapefruit and then we'll play with what the consequences would be gravitationally. And, you know, that's just kind of silly. All right, then the, this, you know, I'm saying it's just, I think it's kind of silly without good cause to think you could do that, that you should think you can do that. I don't know what the good cause would be. Why would you think you could make super compressed matter? I don't think there's any evidence of super compressed matter. Anyway, um, so then the second issue is um, this whole light being controlled by the bent space time and uh, being part of this matter thing uh, <clears throat> that there's the E equals mc squared isn't saying uh, mass or uh, matter is made of energy. Instead, it's saying energy is matter. That we're going to make energy obey the rules of material things, 
and um, it seems again that that's just totally upside down to the reality um, where we understand the simpler things make the more complex thing that the energy is the more fundamental element and the matter is the more complex element the uh, it seems that is something that needs to be some there has to be some evidence why that is a silly or wrong assumption rather than this contrivance um i you know it's fine if somebody uh, shows once i'm in the room i don't need to do this video now so i mean i don't mind having a live conversation instead um so feel free to participate if uh, so motivated uh anyway um join there's a link in the description should be hopefully and the chat thing doesn't seem to be coherent so i'm not bothering with that <clears throat> um so anyway um so the consequence of this is is they've created this circumstance where they can not only bend light but they can create this black hole that creates this situation that makes it impossible theoretically for light to migrate through the universe normally or to do what it normally does which goes from here to there in a straight line at the speed of light and somehow it no longer does that because it's trapped by a black hole and um, I just think you would need cause to, to say why you think that's possible and especially in the circumstance where it violates another one of these conservation rules in the sense that we already know that light is traveling at the speed of light. And when it heads for a black hole from space, it doesn't go faster. So how do you fix that? I mean, you're saying you can essentially make it go slower by applying gravity. <laughs> uh, you know, then it, don't you break conservation if somehow you can not make it go faster by applying gravity seems that we're creating a, an obvious imbalance in some sort of energy equation somewhere um because we're giving we're conceding that light has mass at least i'll concede it has mass in the direction it's traveling it doesn't have any mass in the other directions but anyway and that's the difference between energy and matter matter has mass in all dimensions forward, back, up, down, left, right, and energy only has mass in the direction of its movement. So, <clears throat> um, problems. These are problems, and the scientific community is totally uninterested in defending any of these premises or axioms, these dogmas of their science. Yes, the black holes exist. Yes, they are capable of controlling, manipulating, uh, causing light to do things that are, in my opinion, paradoxically problematic, <laughs> you know, substantially breaking of some sort of idea of conservation. You can make them move right, but you can't make them move left. I mean, that's sort of the same thing as forward and back, left, right, up, down. Um, if you, if they can't, if not conservative forward and back, then who, you know, it just breaks the game logically. Uh, and if you're going to break a game logically, I just think you ought to have some sort of really good explanation of why that's necessary, uh, what compels you to believe it. And then what this whole conversation is in light of the fact that they theorize that these things exist and they, they have no capacity to find one. Uh, they claim it's black holes and they're invisible, but by their own logic, they're not invisible because they have a footprint. They leave a mark on the energy universe uh, and that mark should be detectable logically. Um, no explanation of their formation, creation, um, just none. And you know, <laughs> this is, I mean it's the dogma is that unrelated to any reality. Um, 
it's it's worse. It's it's like the difference between there's there's some religion, uh, you know, where they say thou shalt not, you know, lick dead wildebeests. And you figure it's probably in there, not because it's just some moral dictate, but because, you know, licking wildebeest made you sick. You know, it's like the pork thing or something. They put a taboo on something, not because of a religious reason, but because it be it was so obviously a public health issue. Um, and that was it. You know, it's, it, might, it might have occurred, you know, that this was a fact that... Um, you know, homosexuality might have led to disease or something. And then, you know, there's just a connection because it is more aggressive sex and blah, 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 and promiscuous. And so, yes, there might be a higher likelihood of uh, venereal disease transmission in the homosexual community. And it has nothing to say. It's not a, it doesn't mean anything beyond the fact that it's just an unfortunate circumstance. And a religion could notice that, and they make a taboo against homosexuality for that reason. Um, I'm not saying these, it's probably a bad example because it's always going to have some sort of political correct crapola tied to it. But there's pieces of religion that you could argue have some sort of basis uh, in some social good. Thou shalt not kill, for fuck's sake. Um, and then there's dogmas where you're just saying, that couldn't come from anywhere. That's silly. Uh, thou shalt kiss my ring or some kind of other crap. And it's just like, oh, they just made that up because they liked it personally. Um, so you could just see where the hierarchy was saying, thou shalt not, uh, thou shalt, uh, you know, respect the wealthy or something or, you know, some sort of bullshit. And, you know, because it was convenient to the people writing the book. And then the stuff written because, yeah, it just made social good sense for people to avoid uh, certain um, dangerous activities. Uh, dangerous and it's harmful. All right, that was a long bit of blah, blah. But anyway, that's what I'm seeing in this religion of physics, um, on the, especially on the subject of these black holes. And more specifically on the subject of lensing gravitational lensing. So there's some person, scientist, uh, who does these PBS videos, and uh, very bad, my opinion. Um, <laughs> just pretty crappy science in a lot of ways. Um, sounds all blah, 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 very fast talking, very blah, 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 blah but yet yeah, they just gloss over so much stuff. And it's just this glossing over. Um, consequences and implications and you just can't do that in, in something as strict as physics you gotta be really careful about this glossy thing you can't uh, you gotta recognize when your evidence is strong and when your evidence is weak and you gotta be really careful in saying well if this is true then this could be true maybe that's legitimate but they talk as if this has been proven. It was proven by Einstein's blah, blah, blah. It was proven by the fact that the math didn't work, that this bullshit that we've made up to fix the math must be true. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. You know, because it doesn't fit our model, reality's broken and needs to be fixed. That's what they're doing, right? They have a model, and they love their model so much that if reality does something that doesn't fit the model, they force reality to be fixed. They put something new in reality. They say, oh, well, there must be dark matter. There must be something else to fix it. So they create a problem with a bad model, and then they're, they force reality to be bent to the model. So I got this is a general analysis, blah, blah, blah. I think that's sufficient. All right, so let's see if we can get this. Let's just see if this we can get this, whatever, this screen sherry thing to work. So I have a video in the background. We'll see if it's possible to play. I don't have any, I have no idea if that'll work. Never tried it. So I'm going to hit this button called screen share. See what it does. I hit it. 
so far it hasn't done anything. So far it's not terribly interesting. Ah, here we go. All right. So select the window to show in the video call. Uh, let's see. I don't think I'll select the window with my penis in it. So we have to choose one of these other boring ones. Wow, you can. <laughs> I know you could select all kinds of different kinds of windows. I can do a DOS prompt. Cool. All right, so this is the one we're going to use. So let's hit the button and see if it shares that. Are you being shared? Are you? Are you? Are you sharing? It is doing a lot of shit. So it seems to me it must be doing something. So we'll see whether it shared it properly. So anyway, I will describe it. This might be a little tedious for you. Wait, best picture on the video of a big swirly blob and says, how can scientists study a f far away ball has no light? Well, this admits no light when you have gravitational land by observing its quasar. Oh, so now the black holes have a quasar. <laughs> wow. As a the acceleration disk orbiting the supermassive black hole, um, friction, Mm, interesting. Creates a bright light known as a quasar. So as the thing falls into the black hole, it is ripped into little pieces, apparently, which uh, seems logical. It admits its radiation, uh, even though the gravity is so strong that the admitted radiation should be incredibly red. Not just a little red, but like red shifted all the way into like a radio wave. But anyway. Um, then there, I wonder if that's what they're getting in this video. Researchers use, I don't think they're really researching it, cartoon drawers. So the cartoon drawers use the galaxy size to analyze are, uh, know what they really mean. A ball of crap being torn to pieces of a black hole. Revealing a supermassive black hole with a truly vicious, voracious appetite. Okay, right. This sounds like an overstatement to me. Hit the play button on the video, and we'll see if it plays. Yeah. So it's a big picture of swirly crap. That is dark. Invisible. Cliche introduction and the broken. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, uh, this my computer just passed. So, so this is going to work as a screen share. So maybe I'll just play the video and um, tell you. What images are in it? Because no, this isn't going to work. Can't even get through the intro. Now yeah, this sound sounds proper. Okay, so when the universe, <laughs> what did he just say? What? Close to a black hole, gravity starts behaving. Thing is kind of southish here. All right, so it's an image of a black hole. So let me get rid of the thing because it just isn't on this computer. And Google Hangouts. All right, but it did, uh, you know, so as long as I just show images, I'll be okay. It's playing the video is just asking for way too much, I believe. All right, so the screen share, I imagine I have to go to the button again and hopefully hit it. Oh, stop it. Here it is. Our, uh, you are screen sharing. Stop. Here we go. Present to er er everyone. Yes, well, that's exactly that's what a screen share would be. It's visible to everyone. All right, <clears throat> so, um, so there's a picture of a black hole moving on to the screen. And we probably need a little more audio in the video. And we'll just see if we can play some of this. 
So what they draw is a circle, uh, you know, black circle. So presumably, I don't know where their event horizon is in this image. And um, the black hole has a bright ring around it. And then it has a, a, a fog of light around it. And then the swirly bits of stuff being lensed in the background. So everything, the image of everything in the background gets blurry and fuzzy and whatever. I don't think that would be really accurate uh, way to describe lensing. Lensing wouldn't blurry, but it would put things in wrong positions. Um, yes. But the idea of the ring is a little tricky. The bright ring is the black hole, if it truly is um, diffracting light, it would over diffract it next to the black hole because the gravity is so great that it would create too much deflection in the light and we wouldn't be able to see the stuff that's getting diffracted on the surface because it would get over diffracted. As funny as that sounds. I mean, it sounds kind of funny to say you can do lensing in the first place, but to do it so heavily that you make it invisible again is kind of funny or ironic. But clearly, I don't think that drawing is correct. And also, clearly, nowhere in the drawing do you get the idea of the, the t trailing off of this process of light bending as you get further away from the object, um, there seems to be very little, that they, they've created a, a very wide scope of lensing um, that's clearly not obeying the inverse square law in that it's not nearly as tunneled as it should be because there would be so much difference in the how much the light's getting diffracted that we clearly wouldn't see it in the same uh, with the same volume or clarity no volume clarity those would be important issues in lensing i think in strange ways the flow of space time towards the black hole becomes so strong, so f Okay, the flow of space-time towards the black hole. Interesting language used, right? Because I could argue that now it's the pressure of the gravitons, the flow of the gravitons, in the sense that every individual point in space would be in a pressure field, would have the sense that it's being flowed from all directions. Sitting here in a this pressurized suit called Earth's atmosphere, it's exactly that kind of feeling or that kind of sense we have with knowledge is that everything is pushing us together. And that if you got rid of that pressure, your internal pressure would seep out of you. Fast, that no objects, no information, not even light, can ever pass out of that boundary. Right. So this whole idea, they're just telling us this like this is this is our axiom. Uh, you know, and it's this is a truth that this is what this thing does. Uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> whatever. Now how is that made possible? I mean how I, I mean how you make that practical and I well, I don't point getting all the arguments yet, but I mean, it just doesn't work that both ways then. It's very unconservational. Ultimately, we want to understand how the largest black holes in the universe feed and how they... Okay, the largest black holes in the universe. So obviously, presuming there's something called the smallest black holes in the universe and the any black holes in the universe, the un found thing and we just assume they exist because they need them to exist or want them to exist Bird. this is a huge challenge these black holes are very far away and
Okay, I don't even know why that's true. So is there, a, <clears throat> is there a whole stream of logic that demonstrates why all the black holes are very far away? Why should they all be very far away? They seem like they must be kind of old objects if they've had time to collect a bunch of stuff. So that would put them in the, in the realm of not being way back in time, so to speak, billions and billions of light years away because of time issues of getting light here to us. So they probably should be just as close as we are. They should be in our realm of uh, experience. Basically invisible. All right, so you just said they're basically invisible. Now, logically, this is a lensing video. <clears throat> this is linked from another lensing video the guy did, that this video is about gravitational lensing. Now, quite obviously, using the word invisible for something that's causing gravitational lensing seems a little bit uh, fucked up, because it won't be invisible. If it's lensing, that means that anything behind it is going to be made visible, so stuff that would have been invisible, <clears throat> the stuff behind the core of the black hole, maybe it's only a grapefruit, so there's nothing behind it because it's so small. Um, <laughs> but even so, it doesn't really matter. Everything behind it is either going to be visible when it should be invisible, or if it's, <clears throat> if it's in the, the gravitational field of the black hole, not the core of the black hole, but it's something covered by the field of the black hole, it's going to be diffracted and deflected in a manner that it's going to bring all of that light forward and bring it forward in a condition that should be quite visible. Rings, that kind of thing. However, anything falling towards the black hole will gain. And that means all the light behind it, by the way. <laughs> you know, that means lit objects of very varying distance from the black hole, all of that light still goes through the field of the black hole's gravity. And um, again, it would just be reconfigured um, in, in a noticeably um, perverse to its natural condition. An enormous amounts of energy that produces light Enormous amounts of energy that produces light. Mm, not necessarily. Light's a very small piece of energy, and light is energy. It doesn't get produced. It merely can be stored and then re-emitted. you got to consume it before you can produce it. Light shines bright enough for us to study this object, this newborn quasar, from the other end of the universe. So, distant quasars. So, apparently, this is character number two in the story, the quasar. Music, music, shedding light on black holes. The quasar is the manifestation of a black hole. You know, in the movies, quite often they say the black hole sucks everything in around it. All right, so a quasar is a manifestation of a black hole. So now we have a whole new definition of what these quasars are, right? Quasars in my day were just something, obviously circling something else, and they were doing the blinky thing. That's not quite how it happens. We think. We think, there we go. Well, at least that's something. Uh, we think, but we talk as if it's true, <laughs> you know. We think that matter falls into the black hole through an acceleration disk. So why why just why call it something different than what it is for every piece of matter floating in space? They all have now an acceleration disk because frankly, the black hole is not doing anything special; it's just doing more of it, supposedly that matter falls onto the black hole through an accretion disk? Oh, accretion, sorry. Accretion disk. That sounds even more stupid. <laughs> an accretion disk. So apparently it's this thing that somehow there's gravity, da, 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 and then it goes accretion disky, 
and then goes gravity da 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 which doesn't make any sense. Where is that in anything Newton or Einstein said? Where did, where did Einstein say there's all of a sudden a maximization of gravity and uh, an accretion disk? Where does this come from? There, there's a consistent R squared degrade in your gravity. There's no accretion disk. So stuff will fall towards a black hole, but it usually is coming in and misses by a bit, and so it goes into orbit around the black hole. All right, so even that conceptually is broken. So light goes into orbit around the black hole. So like other matter, it can't accelerate. So unlike other matter that accelerates as it moves towards the black hole, light can't accelerate. So it sort of creates a problem because First, it doesn't start going faster and then, you know, move towards the black hole through the process of acceleration. That's how most things move, is they get accelerated in a new direction. So they're going in this direction, and they get accelerated in a new direction, right? And that's what propels them in a new direction. It's sort of like the Earth going around the sun. It's because it has two accelerations. It has its own acceleration I'm going this way in a straight line and it has this push that keeps knocking it in a new acceleration so it's constantly accelerating down towards the earth so it has that as a real acceleration it's gaining speed going down all the time even though it isn't going faster but it, it's it has it gives it up, has it gives it up, has it, you know, goes back to a straight line, bent, straight line, bent, straight line. So it's, it's like an on-off thing. But it's, that's the only real acceleration. It's native velocity doesn't change. So in a sense, it's doing the same thing once it's in an orbit. But they say because light can't go faster, it can't really do... I mean, I can't bend it. If you, if you can't accelerate, you can't bend it. So right there is another conservation or consistency rule that's being violated by all this mumbo jumbo um, that's just not consistent um, so anyway so the picture is they have a little black thing in the middle a little lumpy they put these little lumpies a little bit of purple a little bit of blue some green and then they do this little yellow thing and red and that's the light getting caught in the accretion disk and as it orbits around the black hole, the matter experiences friction. I thought it, I thought it was light. I thought she said it was light that was getting trapped. Matter would never get caught in an orbit, right? We we do know this, right? Uh, matter is not it doesn't it doesn't go into orbits unless it hits something. So it has to hit the stuff already in the accretion disk, or it has to hit something dense with other material stuff and create collisions to reduce its speed because normal matter will gain so much speed and and if it's <coughs> the the escape it's this escape velocity scenario it, it, you're automatically going to be above the escape velocity if you're going down into the well of a gravity well and your your momentum that got you into the well is the same momentum that's going to get you out of the well it's a conservative force so if you miss the thing in the middle, because you can't get, you know, you came on such a weird angle, you can't get bent enough, you'll just fly back out of the well. So the only way you get stuck in the well is you have to hit something. And this accretion disk couldn't possibly be so wide that it's going to affect things that come into the orbit, anything else but a more straight line trajectory. And if they have anything like a straight line trajectory, they're just going to go straight in hit the hit the black hole. You really can't create orbits by in real in the real world in in spandex land. You know when you synthesize a gravity well, you create friction that slows everything down, and that way you can create an orbit that might be maintained for a couple of seconds. But in reality, you can't do that. And it's that process of an accretion of matter that produces the quasar. So the quasar pops out of the black hole. So they have an image of this orange stuff swirling, and then all of a sudden the black hole shoots a laser beam out of it. And I, I don't know, that's the quasar? I don't know.
boom, and it's making sounds. Science. The quasar is making sounds. The whole aim of these observations is to measure the size of the accretion disk in real units. Uh, right. So I don't know. They somehow can measure the size of something that they can't see or find. <sighs> Great. <sighs> Good work. As with a ruler by color. And in fact, that color is reflecting temperature. And so we expect the size to increase as it goes. Yeah, so they have made it this uh, blue, green, yellow thing. So they're just pretending that everything's doing this, whatever, red shifting or something, or color separation based on speed. Mm, obviously, these. She was talking originally about light. I'm pretty damn sure. So they're just going now by how hot this stuff is, and somehow it uh, appears to be hotter as you go deeper inside. Wow. Now, and it's just how it increases that is really crucial. So just all a synthetic drawing, nothing to do with anything they've actually observed or seen, anything like that. So this is all stuff that they've put on, you know, mathematical equations and say this is going to happen and that this is going to happen and this is going to happen. And um, we already know, I already know, that um, there can be lots of false premises and equations and then you know, fixing them with things like Huygens and uh, dark matter. And we don't know how many fixes this equation has had applied to it. So, man walking through city, very The team of researchers working on our project are in locations scattered around the globe. We get together on conference calls every week or two to discuss observations and new results. <clears throat> observations of what? Where? Through what mechanism are you observing? Then we won't get any of those details. They're just doing science. We're not allowed to know what that science is. Okay, guys, so where are we with these Hubble observations? So they have a, a conference call. Okay, so I'd like to be there and just ask them, you know, since they mentioned, she mentioned Hubble, why are there no Hubble images of solar lensing? I mean, it can do it every day. Why, why, are, why are there no pictures of that? Um, well, we have a graph of the observations so 1422. How do they look? Uh, the Hubble resolution is amazing, and the lens images are very separated. There is separated, yeah. So this is like something they put together where they're they're dramatizing their sessions, and <laughs> so they're all reading their script of the drama. Uh, the the reenactment, yes, the reenactment of their sessions. Nick, do you think the signature will let us measure a temperature gradient? Uh, so the difference in ratios is indicating a, a really clear micro lensing signal. So it's looking pretty good. Okay. So oh, this is all very science sciencey, isn't it? Yes, yeah, much very much sciencey all over the place. So which quasar are we going to be analysing next? Next up is 2026, discovered by our very own Dr. Webster. <laughs> really, it should be impossible to study these objects. Something impossible to study these objects. They're doing the impossible. Isn't that super? We'll take a little break. Uh, <laughs> this is for viewers. I just wanted to see if somebody else popped in the room. That's all. I'll go back to playing the video now. It should be impossible to see right down there into the accretion disk. Oh, no. It should be impossible. That's what he just said. Outside of the universe. <laughs> so the black hole is on the other side of the universe with an accretion disk around it of some sort of thing, all smashed into little bits that are accreted. I don't know. This doesn't really. This is, you know, it's so 
it's so far down the process of the mix making, you know, and you're just saying, I'll get on there. They're like saying to you, I've given ear. I made some food. Trust me. <laughs> you know, and you're just like, yeah, what's in this? What are you making this out of? But if you're curious enough and clever enough, then you can find a way. In this case, we found giant natural galaxy sized lenses. All right, galaxy sized lenses. Now they're showing the galaxy again on its flat side, right? And I've already made this point, but the galaxy is, see how fat the galaxy is this way? See how thin it is this way? See that fat, very fat. So if you lens going this, the light going this way, it's going to be a lame lens because light moves really fast and it's under gravity for only a very, very brief moment. And if you, but yeah, for your lens this way, see? The gravity is big, and you're in it a long, long time. So this <coughs> kind of lens might make some sense. This kind of lens doesn't make any sense at all. But I can't ask him why it makes sense to him. <laughs> yeah. We essentially tack on to the end of the Hubble Space Telescope to see down there into the accretion disk. So it's just a bunch of, they're doing the typical lens images, which are these little slishes of light that are supposed to be in some kind of thing that's causing them, but it doesn't have any shape. Um, there's an implied symmetry, but there is no symmetry if you actually make measurements. So, um, uh, no sale. So I, they're studying, I guess, one of these little slashes of blob and saying, wow, that's something, that's a quasar. We're looking at seven or eight very special quasars, which are gravitationally lensed into multiple images. So we just Okay, so the quasar is gravitationally lensed into multiple images. So I've made this point before, but multiple images is you know, that's that's really problematic because that one means that their lens is doing this really high angle thing. Okay, so we're back to this angle argument. And then if you lens something, you can lens two different ways. If you take just a single image, you can have a lens that has a tiny angle. Uh, that you're changing, and uh, it, it doesn't require you bending a lot of light, but this requires bending a lot of light. So if you do this multiple image, this this image would end up being over here and over here. That means it has to be near the center or right behind the lens, and the angle of reflection or refraction is extremely large then. So you need extremely high gravity to create that kind of a bend in light, theoretically, because I would contend you can't bend light anyway, and this whole conversation is silly. And actually see more than one image of the quasar. Right, so again, it's, it's for that to be true, you have to be well behind the thing, and um, the angle of reflection has to be really big, which means you're really intense gravity. And there's no reason to think there's any intense gravity in the outer dimensions of a galaxy. So now they're showing a picture of the Hubble telescope. And so we can't pick those out. We have to just take them where we find them. It's a chance alignment. Take them where we find them. It's a chance alignment. Well, it actually doesn't even fit with chance because there should be so much more lensing that isn't got a focal point like that and isn't right behind something else and all that kind of stuff. So there should be so many lensed images that you have a hard time telling which ones are which. 
And the particular thing that we look for in gravitational lensing is a mass, such as a galaxy, between us and a luminous background object like a planet. Right. So they just drew the picture. Satellite here looking. Galaxy this way. Little thing over here. So exactly what I was saying before, the, the thinnest part of the galaxy, they say, has the maximum um, gravitational effect. Totally ignoring the fact that this, going this way, is the maximum gravity. Totally ignoring it. Totally not explaining <laughs> why they aren't using galaxies this way to do their lensing. Quasar. The light from the quasar bends around the galaxy, comes to our eyes. Oh, I probably should show this picture just because it implies a bunch of uneven gravity in the galaxy, which I think you could deduce that the galaxy, as you go further and further out, it probably has a very even gravity because all gravities tend to go spherical. They all tend to go round. Um, sphere, in this case, wouldn't be appropriate because the mass doesn't go out, so it wouldn't be spherical gravity. Our brain says it came in a straight line, and so we think that we've seen multiple images. <clears throat> right, so now they're showing dot, 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 dot. So they, I guess they have dot, 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 dot you know, on their philium in terrible resolution, like made out of little square boxes, the resolution is so bad. And they say, okay, that's one thing, the four dots is one thing being lensed by a galaxy that you don't see any dots of in the image. So it must be dark matter because there's nothing in the image to indicate it, that that light team was close to anything Massive, particularly massive. And clearly the galaxy itself doesn't have much gravity at all. And the gravity in our solar system is mostly, <laughs> you know, within you know, a billion miles of the sun, most of the gravity. And then, uh, you know, like 95% of the gravity is within 2 billion miles of the sun. And yeah, it's just, that's where the gravity is. Gravity is now by Pluto. Very little gravity out there. Very little bending. So that's the effect of the galaxy as a whole. But each of these paths of light is also affected by individual stars in that galaxy. Right. So uh, they're saying that they can actually see the light of a very distant object by going close enough to a star, a lit object, and having the light actually penetrate the density of light coming off the lit object, which seems impossible, uh, it survives that. And, um, uh, you know, to some extent, yes, because the angles will be very different. The light from the, the sun will be angularly different than the light going through that field. Um, but again, if this were true, that light of distant objects was routinely being lensed by stars, it means that our whole vision of the universe would be more fake things than real things. It means that everything we look at wouldn't be where it ends up being. So that when our vision in the universe got better and better, as we can see further and further and with more and more resolution, we would find things not where they should have been because our dull vision wasn't as good as our deep vision. But you'd find everything didn't have a location, that everything was the product of a lensed circumstance. And you'd have much more incoherent arrangements. You'd have a situation where things would be, um, uh, you wouldn't have round galaxies. They would all be fun funkily shaped. And if those stars just happen to be lined up along one of those paths of light in just the right way, they cause different parts of that accretion disk to fluctuate in brightness. 
then cause the accretion disk to fluctuate in price. <laughs> but that's obviously they're not affecting the accretion disk. It's billions of light years away. So the, what they're saying is, is the image ends up being fluctuated based on traveling next to a star. How exactly would that take place? The star isn't moving all that fast. There's no, how, how, how would, what, how, who, who started arguing that the light in a lens by the sun would be fluctuating? Why would it be doing that? So as the quasar crosses that field of stars. As the quasar crosses that field of stars. I mean, this isn't what, how a physics should be. It's not the quasar, it's the light from the quasar. Unless you're calling the beam of light a quasar. Okay, so that's what they're calling a quasar then. The quasar is actually just called the beam. So it's the light coming off the flashlight is what they're calling the quasar. <laughs> oh, gee. Confusing much? The Hubble Space Telescope takes a series of photos. Each one uses a filter. So we block out all but a narrow range of the color of the light coming through. So we see different parts of the accretion that's magnified in different ways. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, there's really, so again, they're saying they're seeing an accretion disk because somehow the light being diffracted by different stars is somehow indicating something different about the accretion disk, which is consistent. And they're saying that somehow the image they have because of the incidental arrangement of stars in a galaxy is somehow guaranteeing that they're seeing the middle of the accretion disk and the outside of the accretion disk. And no, 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 no. Uh, there's, I don't think there's any science for that. These differences, we can measure the change in temperature of the accretion disk and determine pretty clearly what type of accretion this is and ultimately that tells us how that black hole is feeding uh whatever how the black hole is feeding this is just well anyway enough of this uh, it's, there's only two minutes left right so go ahead and suffer through it oh actually here this afternoon well i'm only here for about another two or three hours okay uh, yeah and then so. i've got to catch a plane back to australia so. okay so a little time's talk <laughs> uh, yeah so the Apparently, this woman is some sort of head of this project. Project silly waste of money. We'll get a little bit done. Yeah. Okay, so Rachel, here we have the newly reduced Hubble image. Okay, this one is 2026. Yes, I can clearly see the four quasar images. I can clearly see the four quasar images. So that's just again, it's just they're just four little dots, uh, too bright, too dull, too yellow to orange. So there must be a lens and galaxy here in the middle. Yeah. There must be because I've decided what this is and the only way this could exist is I am saying it has to be being lensed by a galaxy here that we don't see. So the galaxy is now invisible and the only thing you're seeing is the thing being lensed. So now they've made galaxies black holes. Oh, I mean this shows the amazing resolution of Hubble. We could never get that separation from the ground. No, it's quite spectacular, actually. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to... <sighs> the separation from the ground issue would, I think, be irrelevant if your lens was big enough, but you can't make a lens big enough. But, I mean, it's the scattering that's the problem. Uh, I don't think that would... Well, it doesn't really matter. I mean, obviously, it's better to have a telescope not affected by an atmosphere, yes. But I don't think this is really a sun issue, so that doesn't... I don't think it's a Hubble issue. It's just the size of the lens. And the Hubble makes your lens seem bigger because it's not being degraded by atmospheric noise. Through the Hubble filters and drop from infrared into visible. Okay, and so if we keep an eye on the pair... So, you know, similar brightness, but watch as we get down into the ultraviolet, that mm -hmm. Yeah, you see the right. Okay, so it didn't change when it went visible filter, and then they, when they put the ultraviolet filter on, it didn't change much either. And then one, and further into the ultraviolet. Oh, that's a big change. That's a big change. It's huge. Yeah, it's, 
it's a seven pixel object. Seven made of seven, well, nine, nine pixels. <laughs> nine pixel the object. Brian, when we look to the greatest distance that our modern telescopes are able, we see bright quasars shining out. Bright quasars shining out. So I thought the quasar was the light actually moving. So now it's a distant object again. So now the object, the accretion disk is either the quasar or what? I mean, could you at least get this one right? No, they won't get it right. One minute the quasar was the beam. Now it's the flashlight again. <sighs> this is impossible. I am getting tired. <laughs> well, really, I shouldn't be up anyway. I mean, yeah, I woke up as I got a toothache and woke me up. The masses of their black holes, and they are gigantic. Much, much larger than we would have expected it would be possible. <laughs> All right. I mean, I would expect any black hole, you know, I wouldn't have expected any size to be possible. So they, apparently there's some limit to how big they think a black hole can be. But I really don't know where that limit would come from considering they just making up this matter compression thing they can just make as much matter as they want and this whole thing of making talking about big doesn't mean anything in the context of big how you mean big in terms of how many solar masses are in it are big in that those solar masses are compressed into a grapefruit i mean they just don't explain that is accretion enough to grow black holes so big Without understanding the accretion, we can't really answer that question. Uh, well, you made up both of these things, so you really should be able to answer questions about things you made up. I mean, the guy who drew Big Bugs Bunny, I'm sure he could answer any questions you want to ask about Bugs Bunny because he drew them and he kind of knows Bugs Bunny because you made him up. It's a bit like a detective story. You know, you get little clues here and there, and the deduction. No, you get almost nothing. Okay, you get this vague idea that somebody fell into a meat grinder, and then you just start making up everything else. The reasoning is the physics. So physics allows you to do certain things and not to do other things. <clears throat> well, it seems like you people don't have any limit to what you can do because you can just invent some sort of fudge to fill the voids. Whatever's missing, you just fudge the uh, you know the gaps. Out of the gaps. So it's really understanding what we're seeing and then allowing the physics to take us down another layer or two to, to stuff that we know is very natural and, and must happen. Yeah, well, whatever. I don't find it so very natural. Does that mean intuitive? So now she can, you know, it's okay for them to use these kind of terms. Um, but yeah, I don't see anything naturally physical in this mishmash of you know, bending light. Early results from the Hubble data indicate that accretion may be occurring at rates even higher than expected. Well, there we go. So it's even higher than they expected. So Bugs Bunny is even taller than we thought. <coughs> they thought. <clears throat> These uh, findings challenge accepted theories of accretion stretching back more than 40 years and provide important clue to understanding how the largest black holes in the early universe were able to grow so quickly. So again, all this assuming that all these black holes exist and that they're doing something and they're doing it all in this rich way and um, but nothing more. And again, um, you know, so they were using traditional uh, galaxy. And so I thought it was a black hole lensing argument. But they're saying they used a galaxy to see a black hole, the accretion disk of a black hole. And they did it based on 74 pixels. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. Not nearly good enough, I don't think. But. Uh, you know, you're not going to be able to get into any of those rooms and have this conversation with these people.
find out what real data they use to justify their extrapolations. Extrapolation, that's the other called an extrapolation disk. So the whole thing seems to be a big swirl of extrapolation. <sighs> All right, so I think I did my job. Um, an hour's worth of blah, blah. But um, yeah, again, this is just simple logic. Light doesn't accelerate. So it breaks conservation rules to say you can stunt its migration, <laughs> trap it in orbits. Um, and the other issue would be, um, you know, this lensing thing, especially the lensing thing with the galaxy argument. Okay, going this way through the galaxy, very little time spent in the gravity of the galaxy, right? Going this way by the galaxy, very much time spent in the gravity of the galaxy. I don't see the explanation for why that isn't true. And that that should mean that all great galactic lenses are this way. You just, it's so much better lens. <laughs> This lens from a galaxy is such a much better lens than this one. Really, really, really hugely better. <sighs> okay, so. Till the next time and such, and so forth and whatnot. Um, yeah, so this was uh, out of sequence. Didn't expect to do this room, but I was up, so I did it. And, and yeah, I'll probably do that with the future draft science videos, I'll provide the opportunity for an open room if somebody wants to talk, and if they won't, don't, then I'll just make a video as I did here, and, you know, I'll try to increase the production values where possible. Yeah. I'll probably do better, but, you know, uh, I'm probably not going to be able to do much better because, you know, I have so much stuff on my mind. So much, uh, I'm just, you know, it's all very exhausting being brilliant. <sighs> anyway, till next time.